Well, I've been involved in biodiversity most of my professional life. I am trained as a biologist, but um, uh, in the process itself, I first got involved in 1994 uh, when I came to the State Department and uh, attended in 95 the first SUBSTA, the first subsidiary body on science, technology, and technological affairs, and then attended the second biodiversity COP uh, in Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, and I've been subsequently to uh, nine of the 11 COPs, uh, well, counting the second one, I've been to nine, only missing the first and third COPs. Um, I went to the first, I think, six SUBSTA meetings uh, and attended those. I do not attend those nearly as regularly as my responsibilities have shifted over the years. I left State Department for a while and went and worked for AID, where I was involved, our U.S. Agency for International Development, where I worked with many of our missions, particularly in Latin America, on um, biodiversity and environmental related matters in terms of the programs that they ran, helped to them with design of programs as well as evaluation and, and um, uh, cooperation with others. Uh, so I've been involved um, really since I moved to Washington in, in 94, have been continuously involved in some way in different levels of responsibility and, and in different roles uh, on the delegations that I've attended. But um, it's been a pleasure to, uh, and, and uh, quite a fascinating journey to see how the convention has matured and changed over the years and how different parties and non-governmental organizations are engaging. And how would you assess over that time, how has biodiversity and the, envir and the environment um, become, I don't know, involved, embedded in the State Department's policy, in U.S. policy in general? How, is the, how would you assess the, the environmental um, progression and, and awareness in the U.S.? Well, I think that there's always a, a little bit of a waxing and waning in terms of the particular interests of uh, senior political people, but um, uh, certainly currently there's a great deal of interest in environmental issues broadly and in how they relate to uh, our broad policy on development. Uh, we have a presidential policy on development uh, that President Obama has put forward um, and uh, as part of that we certainly look at natural resources as a keen component of, of that. Uh, we bring a lot of issues, uh, um, broad issues and development to this venue and to many other international venues in terms of looking at components of good governance and um, transparency and science-based decision making. Uh, we try to bring those emphasis, um, uh, those kinds of emphasis which we use across the board uh, to the discussions in this venue. Uh, learning from our own domestic experience and that of our technical agencies. They are very involved in our delegations. We come here as we're not a party. Uh, we have a very robust international program, both bilaterally and our aid. Uh, we engage multilaterally across the board and with UN bodies and with the multilateral development banks. Uh, and, um, and we work with very many different uh, institutions. We bring, there's a lot of technical cooperation between U.S. institutions, both governmental and non-governmental, uh, that are there, and we promote that. We promote the engagement of our civil society with civil society groups in other countries, many of which are involved and interested in biodiversity, and they make governance and good governance uh, really tangible to local communities, and we think that these are real opportunities to promote democracy and good governance and good development policy and so biodiversity has been an aspect of that broad emphasis and it is taken very seriously within the department and within the US government. You mentioned the US isn't isn't a party. Can you give us the history of that? Why the US is, is not a uh, an official party to the CBD and how does that how does that affect how you operate within this within this arena? Well, the U.S. did sign the CBD shortly after it was completed at the Rio summit. I think it was either 93 or 94 that President Clinton signed it. I couldn't give you the exact date, but uh, I think it was uh, possibly June of either 93 or 94. 
it did go to the Senate in uh, 94 and uh, was voted out favorably from the Committee on Foreign Relations. Uh, but it then got caught up, I think, in the politics of the election in 94, um, and it never came up to a full vote of the Senate. Uh, for the United States to ratify any treaty, um, it requires two-thirds of our Senate, uh, the same number that would have to vote in favor of a declaration of war. Uh, it is a, a very steep hill to climb for us to engage, and um, there are skeptics within uh, our, our um, legislative branch of both um, uh, envi the, the, the value of engaging in environmental treaties as well as some that are skeptical of the United Nations in general. Um, and and uh, basically, uh, many have argued, should we be necessarily entangled in that as a legal party, we can engage through uh, our expertise on the issues and not become necessarily tangled up because we have such a robust uh, domestic engagement in issues of biodiversity through the Endangered Species Act, through uh, the many different things, our coastal zone management and the, just the uh, number of uh, sustainable uh, agriculture programs and different aspects we do through our national park system. and, and uh, certainly the environment and biodiversity is a huge issue in the United States and we consider ourselves leaders historically and contemporary. Um, in terms of our engagement here at the convention, it's quite different from a, a convention where we are a party and um, some of the issues that we are not in a situation where we can introduce text or block text that goes forward. Uh, we sit, as other observers do, in many of the working groups and that. Uh, we can whisper in the ears of, uh, or, or sometimes make a statement after parties have made statements uh, about the uh, merits or um, uh, uh, concerns that we might have over some language, but we're not in a position to be able to introduce or block text going forward. So we do bring a very technical delegation to these uh, of individuals, many of whom are, are from various agencies of the U.S. government that cooperate internationally. And biodiversity is an issue that we are concerned about internationally uh, as a source of wealth for many nations. Uh, we, we are concerned. So we have people from our Department of Agriculture and from the Smithsonian Institution and from the Department of Interior and from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and folks that have cooperative engagement with uh, governments, multilateral institutions and civil society organizations around the world. And we bring the expertise that we have from our domestic engagement on the issues, as well as our international engagement through USAID. We have one of the largest earmarks for biodiversity of any development assistance agency in the world. Uh, the United States gives over, in just bilateral assistance and ODA, uh, over or, or around $200 million a year uh, in bilateral assistance in the area of biodiversity. Uh, in addition to that, we're a major funder of the Jeff and, and other areas. Uh, so this is an area that we consider very important. We believe that conservation and sustainable use are, are really critical to sound development uh, in the use of, of biodiversity and genetic resources. And so uh, we come here with some of that expertise, looking at the agenda and the topics and try to engage as positively as we can, saying this is our experience here uh, in a particular area and this is how we can, uh, we, we might recommend you go forward, which would capture some of that experience and, uh, and take that into account. When you read the, read the headlines about the number of endangered species on the planet and the level of deforestation, it would be easy to think uh, oh, perhaps it, perhaps it's true that we're on a sort of da a downward spiral. Um, what what would you say have been the achievements of the of the CBD in the sort of last twenty years? And and I guess what what gives you hope that um, 
whilst at the moment the headlines might be fairly bleak, but you know there, there is a kind of trajectory to 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 sort of recover some of that lost ground. Well, I think that there's much broader awareness of the critical nature of biodiversity and how important it is broadly within the uh, for development issues and for natural resource management. Um, I see things like the increase in the number of protected areas uh, in terms of where things are. I see, and particularly at this COP and uh, because of maybe some of the ACHI targets that we're not just concentrating on conservation, but now beginning to address some of the drivers of biodiversity loss. And I think that it's, it's really critical that you don't simply look at protected areas, that you look at policies which affect uh, agriculture and forestry and fisheries and try to look at those kinds of issues. Uh, so that in the area of fisheries, you know, you're not depleting stocks, you're actually looking at how fisheries might turn around. And we've actually seen that take place in a number of different situations. Domestically, we've had some real successes uh, with uh, a variety of species in the United States. Um, and we see some of that taking place around the world. Uh, it's, it, it takes some time to make changes. We've seen in the focal areas of, 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 uh, con of uh, protected areas and conservation, there has been real movement and real progress, and that needs to continue. That's the insurance policy, kind of, the protected areas. Uh, but we also see now much more of an effort to try and mainstream biodiversity awareness into broader development policies in the various development sectors taking those issues into account um, as you look at the need for development and poverty alleviation, uh, but also trying to understand how we can do that in such a way that does not undermine the natural capital on which our development is based in the long run. And I guess the final point, how hard is it to be a, a U.S. diplomat in, in this kind of arena? Because the U.S. has always looked to... Uh, to, to show leadership, I guess, around the world. It's the biggest economy in the world, sort of traditionally over the past 100 years, perhaps less, the, the, the world leader. How hard is it to be a, a US diplomat in this arena when people are looking for leadership and perhaps you can't always give them the answers that they're, they're wanting? We do what we can here in terms of, as I say, sharing the, the technical um, uh, expertise that we have trying to share our experience in terms of making institutions more effective and efficient. Um, and I think that people do look to us, uh, people who um, realize that whether or not they agree with what we say, that we do bring a, a certain level of, of uh, engagement and expertise to the table. And I'm, I think we, we are listened to. And, and that's good. We have to be careful where we engage on. Uh, and and uh, there, there are moments of frustration, but there are moments of frustration even where we are full parties and in other venues and in other fora. Um, the, a, a multilateral process that involves most, if not all, of the countries of the world and to try and achieve consensus on, on issues uh, when countries are represented by individuals that are bringing their own national interest, as I bring my own national interest to the table. Um, but I try to, to make sure that it is science-based, that it is technically based. And um, th there are challenges and opportunities in doing that uh, in this venue, just as there are in, in any different fora or um, institution that we engage in or with any country or, or process. It's, it's different, um, but uh, we make the best of it and uh, we continue to engage in the topic because it's important and we will continue to engage uh, in the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity on a global basis and it will impact our foreign policy and our development policy in particular. Um, around the world and, and I think that that's a good thing because I think we do have a tremendous amount that we can contribute um, and we welcome the, the warm um, uh, engagement that we have from many in this venue. One last question. This is the 
UN's decade on biodiversity. Do you sense um, an urgency in the negotiating chambers when you observe um, different countries talking over text? Do you sense that need to come to agreements on biodiversity in this key decade? Well, I think we've made a lot of progress on a lot of the technical areas and that um, all countries are being challenged because of the economic situation these days. Um, but I think that as we, and, and so everybody wants help, but I think that as we understand that uh, the major achievements will really be based upon mainstreaming biodiversity, about looking at um, how s development policies in all countries, developed or developing, uh, impact biodiversity loss. Um, I, I think as we take those into account, uh, we are becoming much more serious about it. And I think that maybe people aren't seeking headlines so often, but seeking practical solutions. There's one of the things that came out of Rio uh, is a renewed emphasis on uh, the valuation of natural capital. And can we go beyond GDP? And I think that countries are looking around uh, for opportunities, and biodiversity is certainly a component of valuing natural capital and going beyond GDP, is, is what those are using innovative financing mechanisms like payment for ecosystem services. So I think people are breaking out of the traditional it's just ODA or it's just this or that and really trying to be creative about how we actually address and find solutions to finally turn around uh, and, and significantly reduce the loss of biodiversity that's, that has taken place over the past decades.